Hello, welcome to another Maximum Power Up video. I can feel like I've said that quite a lot at the moment. I need to come up with a better intro, really. Um, today, I want to uh, do a bit of discussion about uh, the Super Nintendo for a change, uh, or more importantly, the Super Famicom. Now, as I mentioned on the last video, if anyone um, has seen it yet, um, only from yesterday, uh, where I was talking about the starts on ukulele and Resident Evil 7. Um, I did state right at the end, we're having to have a little bit of a um, move around with a couple of uh, episode topics. Just things like, you know, people having time uh, that we're going to feature on episodes. So um, just again, just to mention it now, uh, our next episode, which should be out towards the end of next week, so about this time next week, um, will be myself and Julian doing it again. And we're basically going to be talking about our favourite um, point and click adventure games and our experience um, with that genre. We will be covering more Super Nintendo stuff because Phil, um, Amy and Chris have obviously got all their research done. Um, it's just basically just, you know, uh, we obviously do this as a hobby. Um, and, you know, it's just as like, you know, time permitting. Um, but yeah, so we will obviously be getting up to that. And what I wanted to do was just do a couple of um, Super Nintendo slash Famicom um, related videos uh, over this bank holiday weekend. Uh, just to keep it within the um, proposed Super Nintendo month. Uh, again, massive thank you to everyone who's downloaded uh, the latest episode. Uh, with me, Alex and Julian on it. It's done extremely well in just uh, over a week. Um, and that's obviously great to see because, you know, I've said it before, when you're sat there and you're editing away bits and trying to tidy little bits up and cutting out all my waffles, saying you know and obviously and all the sort of uh, verbal tics, uh, it does get frustrating at times. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and again, thank you for any new subscribers um, on the channel. Um, it's, you know, starting to take, pick up and grow a little bit now. So um, I know now I'm not just uh, talking at the camera. There's people actually watching it. So uh, excellent. Uh, just for a start, I'm just having a quick look on the old uh, Coinop 7. Um, I'll be trying this later. The Shadow, uh, scroll and beat them up on the Super Nintendo. Never played it. As far as I was uh, aware, it never actually came out as a proper release. So I don't know if it's going to be like a full ROM of it or what. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to have a quick look at that anyway. I've never seen the film, you know, with uh, the Caleb Baldwin. Anyway, what I want to talk about is the Super Famicom. Um, and obviously, I've said a million times that my favourite ever magazine is Super Play. But don't worry, I'm not just talking about Super Play today. Um, and I think the thing is when you're looking at Super Famicom is some amazing artwork. Uh, obviously, I've said so many times that Will Overton's artwork really, really does stand out. It's absolutely amazing. And you can still see the influence, you know, um, years later with uh, fanzines such as Hyperplay, which I did mention uh, a couple of videos back. Uh, so any, any fans, again, of Super Play, and into the RPG genre, should I check out Hyperplay for the sake of a few quid? I think five of a postage is well worth it. Um, and then the other thing I do want to just mention before I actually talk about some games is you know it's obviously got an audience the uh, Super Famicom artwork because done by uh, Bitmap Books, don't really like Last Plug, uh, which came out last year, the Super Famicom uh, box art collection. You know, it just shows like so many, has to choose one with some better artwork, really. Um, oh, so, you know, comparing the artwork to the PAL release from the, um, you know, Super Famicom releases to some of the PAL releases were absolutely worlds apart, you know. Um, and it's just great as well, seeing a bit of a write up. So, if anyone's not got this book, um, it's well worth checking out, you know, like on a Bitmap Books' site. Um, so, yeah. It definitely, definitely worth having a look at that. Now, on to the main topic. God, after almost five minutes, there's me waffling on. So, what I wanted to do was um, basically talk about, said I want to mention it again, the Superplay Top 100, but linking it into my collection. So, with the Superplay Top 100, obviously Superplay, known for, um, see, I can't help myself, honest to God, if I had to pay 
50p every time I mention a magazine. Uh, well, the ad pod bankrupt. Anyway, so with their top 100, um, there were quite a lot of games in it that were either only came out on import, you know, either um, Japan only or Japan and America. So therefore, there was no um, UK or, well, PAL release at all, uh, which obviously just makes some games quite difficult to um, get hold of and add to your collection. Now, with some of the games that I've ticked off my list, um, I have picked up the Super Famicom version for price reasons, because sometimes the price is a lot better. I know that friend of the show, Matt Aguilera, uh, not, but, sorry, well, he's also a friend of the show, but Matt Lamborn, um, he's like really, really into collecting for his Super Famicom stuff, and he's picked up some right bargains, you know. Um, sorry about that, Matt. Matt's uh, saying the wrong Matt first. Oh, God, anyway, getting himself in some sort of like a Matt attack. Anyway, bad puns. Um, so what I've been doing is some of these games I've been picking up on Super Famicom. Um, varying, you know, degree, uh, degrees of uh, condition. And the thing is with some of the games, you can just play them, even over in, um, you know, Japanese. And it doesn't affect the uh, storyline at all. Uh, there's something like an RPG, that obviously would be more of an issue, and there are a couple of those that I am going to touch upon in a moment. So, um, basically I've pulled out all my Super Famicom stuff, just have a quick look. Some of them are in the top 100, in fact I think all of these ones are uh, all apart from one. So anyway, I'll have a quick look. So, first up we've got Axley. Now, Axley I've had in my collection for a while. Now. Again, not in best condition. I think I paid about a tenner for this on Super Famicom, so it's not bad at all. I'm sure, you know, like I could have maybe got it in better condition. But again, we've said this so, so many times, so many uh, podcasts and videos. I love, you know, the little trays, um, the manuals, I think are absolutely fantastic, you know, um, and how they just like, well, sit in the tray, you know, just covering the cart. It looks so nice. And, um, you know, like the amazing artwork inside and things like that. There's just something, um, a bit of a throwback really for me because I'm lucky enough to be the age where I used to be able to go to your independent shops, as we said on the last podcast, and, uh, you know, see the Super Famicom games like when I used to go into Manchester or a couple of local shops down in uh, Lee, uh, near me, up at North West. Um, so yeah, it, it's always nice to see that, you know, it sort of like just brings back so many memories. Now, next game is a perfect example of a price difference. Now, Chrono Trigger is not available on PAL. So, although you can get it on NTSC American, uh, it just cost about now, yeah, it's gone past £100 mark, which is crazy because only a couple of years ago it was probably about 60 or 70 quid last time I checked. I never got around to getting it, but I paid £15 for this. Now, I know that I've got bombs of it on there. The way I look at it is, if I wanted to get a, um, what's it called? Um, oh, Retron 5, you know, I could always um, try out the uh, translation patch. So, what I picked up was, corn trigger, put it in a like, nice little bag, protect it um, in really good condition. Manual, obviously, with it being an RPG, fantastic condition, and you know it just looks so nice. I mean, this this manual is almost brand new. You know, there's like, there's like hardly any bending to it or anything like that. So, what I'm trying to get at is, is it um, not cheating us to put it but is it like sort of like an acceptable way to still have these in your collection because technically you've got the physical cart um and obviously nowadays we've got access to so many uh different ways of playing them roms uh, the translation patches as said um and then also you've got things like um Chrono trigger on ds uh virtual console uh, i can't remember if that is on there or not off the top of my head but the way I look at it is, yep, I've got a real one in my collection, no problem playing it on um, emulation. Anyway, next up we've got another one by Squaresoft, Front Mission, Giant Max. 
tactical RPG type thing. Don't know if anyone's played it. Now I got this off, oh god, I think it was off Ali, uh, the Retro Hunter ages ago. Recently just opened his uh, first shop. Uh, so massive congratulations to him. And he sent me something in bloody nice condition there. Again, all bagged up. And some really nice uh, screenshots, artwork, things like that in the um, manual. Now, with Front Mission, even though it's in Japanese, there's quite a lot of English in it. So, easy enough to play through the game without obviously needing to know the Japanese language. And again, in the top 100. So, that one wasn't that bad to get hold of price-wise. Same with this next one. We have... Legend of Mystical Ninja, well, Goldman 2. Now, on Super Famicom, there's a few of these now. Um, I've only got one and two. I've got number one on American because it's got released in every region. Uh, the second one, though, was Super Famicom only. Still got the Yen sticker on down there, which I absolutely love seeing those. And there we go, some amazing artwork. So by Konami, uh, again, recently did an episode on uh, Konami. So with this we have got, I think this was about 10 all together, um, actually from Japan. Really nice looking car, uh, really, really colourful. And then we've got uh, the manual in, I can't remember the exact uh, term, so I do apologise. But you know, like how obviously the, like, the books are uh, read from back to front. Um, some really, really good, well drawn art. A uh, little bit of a tatty manual, but, you know, not too bad, really. Um, still not actually played this, so I don't know how much you actually need to learn uh, Japanese to actually understand it and really, really get into um, playing the game. And then another one, now this one that isn't in the top 100, you're not really going to be able to t um, make out what it is too well, but this is going to be called Lady Stalker. Now, this is very, very faded. I spent £3 on this, I think it was possibly for from uh, a shop in Bury um, called Victor Wright's Electronics and he's been there for years and the back's not as bad. Um, he's has his stuff like left in the shop window it's obviously got some faded as you can tell here. The inside though is in really good condition so got that there again this was Japanese only and we've got the manual again in really good condition with a nice bit of like little comic strip there as well. Now, Lady Stalker is in the series of Landstark on the Sega Mega Drive. Uh, I've recently picked up a, um, oh God, that squeaks so much. I've recently picked up a Nintendo Magazine System magazine, um, which reviewed Lady Stalker. Um, something that I was, you know, they didn't, well, they didn't really uh, review that many import only games. And we gave it a really good review. So a bit more of your isometric RPG. Well, anyone who's played Landstalker will know what to expect. Um, I wasn't a massive fan of that game, so I've still not got around to trying that yet. And I think I've had it now for almost a year. But like I said, for a few quid for a Super Famicom RPG, pick it up, see if you can actually stumble your way through it. Next up, we have got a few more. Now, this one, I've got a feeling you might actually need uh, quite a lot of uh, knowledge of um, Japanese language. We have got Ogre Battle. Now, a fair few Ogre Battle games came out. This is one that I bought, oh god, um, again, probably about a tenner because I went over, got quite lucky with a fair few titles, so around that £10 mark. Um, I've not actually played this yet at all, so I've not even had it in my machine. Um, one thing I do like is when you get, you know, the little uh, warranty cards and Things like that still inside the tray. It just adds a little bit extra, really, doesn't it? Um, so it's not like you can actually um, respond to me now and go, yes, Paul, yes, it does. Well, you could in the comments. Cheap plug there. Um, so with this, a bit more of a uh, tactical type RPG by the looks of it. Um, we've got some, again, comic uh, strip there. More of a comic strip. So, God, it's like so loads in this. Um, yeah. Oh, that's actually quite nice. Um, in fact, that might be the first time I've actually had a proper look inside the box to a uh, Ogre Battle. But um, yeah, series that's quite popular. Um, I know that I think 
Chris is a fan uh, on the team, I think, of the N64 version. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's not the type of game that had a UK release, but there is an American one. I'm pretty sure of that old battle game, there's two of them on the um, Super Nintendo, as far as I remember. Next up, we have got something that I'm very happy to have in my collection now. The Proteus games. Oh, just hold all three up like this. I'm probably not going to open these up just right now. Actually, sad that I will do. So, we have got... Um, Super Proteus, Proteus 3 and Sexy Proteus, I think it was called, or that's what it was, uh, you know, translates into. Um, now, the first Proteus I managed to get from uh, the uh, Leeds uh, video games, well, the Doncaster video games market, sorry, uh, last year for £15, because in my local CEX, to get it on PAL, you're looking more about the £50 mark. Again, well-loved series, well-loved game, and... Uh, 50 quid, you know, it's it's quite a lot really, um, and then to get it, well, I got this for an absolute bargain obviously, because even if you get it on Super Famicom, it will cost you a little bit more, um, but it's one of the games that you don't actually really need to know the language, it's same with things like any shoot em ups, you can just pick them up, get into them, and away we go, uh, next up we've got this, is it like chatting Parodius? I've, I did a uh, search for them because I got these last two Parodius games uh, late last year. And again, they're in really good condition. Still all bagged up, the cartridge. These uh, other two cost me £45 each, which was, you know, quite a good price. Uh, a couple of little uh, cards, uh, you know, warranty cards. And then we've got a Pop and Twimby characters that you can be in the game as well. Um, still actually not had a moving machine. Um, really am uh, getting behind and actually playing some games um, at the moment. I think that's one reason I said that, uh, did that video of choosing just 10 games to uh, get stuck into and try out. And then just so I can quickly do it. Uh, probably not got too many more to go. I'll try and make this as quick as I can. Um, so with the other Proteus, we have got the cart on a good condition, and again, just uh, some of the manual, some of that fantastic artwork, and again, Konami, you know, been very, very well loved, at least back then, uh, before we just did some more Metal Gear Solid games and um, Pro Evo. Um, I suppose anyone who's my age, you know, uh, yearns for those glory days again of Konami, I don't know if we'll ever get them. Um, but that's for an entire different discussion. Um, the other ones I'm just going to basically have a quick look at. Uh, we have got Prince of Persia, which I think was about seven quid. I'm not going to open it up, it is fairly knackered, that one. Uh, got that when I was up here at Nerg last year. Um, anyone who's played Prince, Prince of Persia knows what to expect. Then I also got Puzzle Bobble. Uh, Prince of Persia obviously you can get on PAL as well, uh, but the Super Famicom one is fine just to play through it, you know what to do. Uh, Puzzle Bobble, again, you know what to do for this. You can actually get a PAL version. Um, well, it usually comes from Italy, but that's usually about 80 quid, you know, just called, uh, well, Buster Move. Um, here though, we have got a cart in really good condition. I spent £20 on this um, a couple of months ago. And you know what to expect anyway from uh, Puzzle Bobble, so you don't need, you know, um, it to be in English or anything like that. You know, just pop the bubbles and uh, beat the other player. You know, dead, dead easy. So that's again a good example of just a game you can pick up and play. Same with this one. We have got Samurai Spirits. Again, one on one fighter. I'm just going to start rocketing through these because I don't want to uh, be recording for ages and ages. So, again, loads and loads of one on beat em ups, one on one beat em ups. Um, probably about, I'm sure it was about 15 quid that, because again, I did buy it a fair bit back now. Um, now, another one that I've mentioned on our Hidden Gems episode Side Pocket on the Super Nintendo. You can also get it on the Sega Mega Drive. Side Pocket is not a bad sports game. Um, and it's in English as well. So um, to get it like from America it can cost you quite a bit of money. But if you get the Japanese version, think again, it's usual around a tenner or thereabouts. 
um, again, nice and conditioned, old manual, well, you know, little warranty cards in the back. And then you've, again, you've got the um, instructions and everything like that. It's a really good game side pocket, one I actually have had in the machine and played. Um, just nice to do, like, loads of trick shots and stuff like that. Done by uh, Data East. God, that noise really goes through me. Um, last couple now. So next up, we have got one that does cost a lot if you get it on NTSC. And basically, I cannot pronounce the Japanese name, but this game is uh, Twisted Tales of Spike McFang, uh, the American uh, name of it. Now, this cost me about 16 quid. Um, I honestly cannot remember its uh, Japanese name, um, but a bit of an RPG. One of the things that you probably would need the... Uh, you know, um, the language patch for, if there is one. Uh, again, cart, manual, but again, I've got ROMs of this as well. I've had a quick go of the ROM of it, um, so I've not actually um, tried this in the machine um, at the moment. Again, it just sells for so much. You know, the American one, I think the last time was about 150 quid when I had a look for that. And then we have also got super family tennis now this one i got from uh play expo manchester i think again it was only about 12 quid really good condition not actually played it but it really has been looked after um we've got the manual nicely sealed up in a little bag there and same with the uh cartridge so yeah i think this was probably about uh, a year or so ago when I got this and um, yeah it's in absolutely fantastic condition you know especially for its age as well then lastly we've got Tetris Battle Gaiden that I ended up getting for my birthday last year uh, again not something that you really need the language for you know what to expect uh, again no manual with this one uh, but I knew that it hadn't I just wanted to get it in the collection because again the value can be anything from about 20 quid to get it boxed up to about 35 40 so i just wanted to get it you know i've seen it like listed so many times it's gone up and down so yeah um that's that i've still got a few more that i want to get so like our type 3 for example um which i do want to get boxed to get it on uh you know pal release can be like about 150 quid to get it on super famicom more around the 100 pound mark and even things like super contrast slash super pro protector even value of that has gone up quite a lot recently on Super Famicom. I think uh, with the Japanese looking after the games a lot more, um, when they say it's in good condition, my God, it's almost mint condition in the eyes of, you know, um, English uh, collectors. Well, at least the ones that try and sell on eBay, but that again, different topic altogether. I know that um, people like Lee at Soul Thumb Retro Games, he goes over to Japan quite a bit. He comes back with all sorts of stuff, but even he says the prices are going up because obviously even the retro boom has affected over there with people just wanting to get loads of cheap stuff and obviously then you're hiking the market up. So yeah, that's it really. Um, I've been going on a little bit, so I do apologise for waffling on. Uh, that was just a very quick look at the Super Famicom games. Um, as I said, that's, well, God, almost 10% of me uh, Super Play Top 100 there. Um, Oh, there we go, another mention for Superplay. So yeah, anyone who's a fan of Superplay was obviously would have seen some of these games mentioned in the magazines. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of people who collect import stuff. I know that Julian's a massive fan of it. Um, and the team of Phil's got quite a lot as well. So always good. Something just feels a bit more magical and special about buying these Super Famicom titles. But anyway, that's all for me. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.